Hello, my name is Jason DeWeese. I'm an AWS Solution Architect, and we're all here for a case study on how mobile device service company Asurion architected its application on AWS Edge for speed and security. That was the short title. You should have seen the original one. It's longer. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jabez. Jabez works for Asurion. He's their cloud security architect. Um, I've worked with him for a couple years on some of this use case. So he's got a lot of great information to share with us on how they've architected a solution. And he'll even give you a demo of how it works. And then we'll hang around for Q&A afterwards. If anybody has questions, we'll be up here uh, towards the front uh, to, to my right of the stage. Be happy to answer any questions about Asurion's use case or any AWS questions related to it. So all right, thank you, Jabez. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you joining us for this session. Um, but let's get started. So Asurion, as some of you may know, is in the business of helping uh, technology that we uh, have become integral part of. You know, technology has become so much part of our lives that uh, our phones, laptops, uh, tablets, Asurion is in the business of helping people make sure that they stay connected, they stay online. We have over uh, 300 million customers across the globe. And uh, we ensure that uh, uh, whether it's your uh, cell phones or tablets or laptops, we ensure that you are uh, protected and connected. And also we do this by device protection, uh, making sure that your devices in the event of a break or uh, any issues with the device or tech support uh, in the area of making sure that you get the best and most out of your devices. <clears throat> and also in the area of uh, retail, you know, where uh, whether it's in your washing machine or things like that, we also make sure that it's covered. And today's agenda, we're going to be talking about uh, five main topics. We're going to be talking about a layered metho methodology approach, and you'll see in a little bit what that is, and uh, some of the reasons why we went all in AWS Edge, and uh, the ways that we implemented some of the um, ways that Amazon uh, allows us to uh, use their services. And also, we'll have a, a, a quite a little bit of a demo of some of the impl implementation patterns. And then we'll go into the patterns themselves, and then some of the do's and don'ts. Uh, and then, um, as Jason mentioned, if you have any questions afterwards, uh, definitely feel free to stop, uh, stop by. Just to get started, uh, you know, we'll be covering a lot of these services. Some of them are uh, CloudFront, which would be a majority of our uh, discussions. We'll do a lot of Lambda at the Edge. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we've done with Lambda at the Edge in dealing with how do we do um, uh, routing, how do we do blue-green, how do we do uh, A and B testing, and in that sort. And also we'll deal with uh, how to deal with hybrid type environments with on-premises dependencies. And um, uh, also uh, doing some information about API Gateway and leveraging Route 53 for some of the workloads. When we talk about layered methodology, uh, there's three different layers that I would like to uh, cover. And when we think about from a network layer, um, we think about all the different services that Amazon offers, whether it's your CloudFront, Route 53, load balancers. And it mainly de deals you know, from a deployment perspective. A lot of times people are looking at it from a network layer. You know, they're thinking about how does my traffic get in? How does my traffic get out? Uh, what are my dependencies when I'm dealing with hybrid environments? What are some things that I need to consider when I'm uh, uh, dealing with whether it's a VPN or Direct Connect? And that's our uh, network layer. Then you think about the content layer, where uh, it's more from a business perspective, faster time to market, how can I get my products in, uh, you know, in the market, and how can I deploy the content that I need for my customers? And also dealing with things like blue-green deployments, uh, A and B uh, type deployments, and also uh, how do I do dynamic queries? You know, how do I manage that? And of course, the final one, which is very important, is the security layer. On the security aspects of it, we uh, have inherent built-in uh, capabilities like DDoS, but also leveraging WAF and uh, some of the other features, end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, dealing with also regulatory requirements. You know, with Ashrion being global, we have a lot of regulatory requirements when we deal with data. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, how we uh, uh, helped accomplish some of that. From a network layer, and uh, you know, a lot of this has a lot of uh, details on it. I'm going to touch on a few of the points on these. From a network layer, uh, some of the things that we uh, leveraged were, from an on-premises perspective, using the identity provider that we already had, uh, and also from uh, using uh, elastic uh, network interfaces for uh, services that had dependency on-premises. So on-premises, you know, as you know, there are a lot of times the firewall rules and things are very uh, tightly coupled with you know, static-type rules. 
And whenever you're dealing with cloud applications, you have to deal with services that are dynamically changing. And a lot of times it, 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 it makes it easier when you have a dependency to attach an ENI to the service and be able to open that firewall so you don't lose that. And also, uh, from a, a A and B versus blue-green deployments perspective, we uh, dealt a lot with, from a blue-green is multiple stacks where you're having multiple origins that you're deploying it to, versus A and B on the same stack, you're having different versions that you're deploying your services to. And uh, on, a, on, a, on a canary deployments type uh, uh, scenarios, a lot of times it's good to leave um, uh, like some traffic that's permanently getting 5% of your traffic and uh, uh, you know, servicing the customers to ensure there's no errors when you're, uh, le you know, when you're taking in new workloads. And on the content layer, there's a lot of um, uh, importance given to end-to-end -to -end, um, uh, in ensuring that there's end-to-end -end TLS on all the content, right? From the time you enter in to the time you are reaching to your backend services, ensuring that whether it's your uh, certificates or whether it's reaching to your database, uh, you know, you have end-to-end -end, uh, SSL uh, control. And also, uh, you know, we had some challenges with WordPress uh, with, when dealing with CloudFront, where we had to ensure that the, some of the headers were being forwarded so that WordPress uh, is able to accept that, because WordPress has some dependencies on what uh, you know, requests the traffic from, uh, from an external uh, deployment perspective. And, um, in, and also, uh, cache invalidation. It's important that uh, you, know, you don't just invalidate cache because uh, it's uh, you know, on a single file level. You have to make sure that you invalidate cache on a global, like a directory level. So if you have some more short-lived caches, you could have it segregated into a, its own directory. And some more long-lived caches, you could have its own directory. That way, you're not paying for cost, you know, because cache can be quite expensive. And on the security layer, um, you know, we, we followed a multi-layer approach. We went with geo-restriction for uh, countries. So when we had workloads that are specifically for uh, the US, we had, a, a, you know, we had restriction on the CloudFront layer, where we have a geo-restriction on, uh, on, the, on the country level. And also, uh, where we could, when we are dealing with partners, where we have IP restrictions. So when we have WAF attached to it, you could say, OK, these partners are going to be using these IPs. Uh, reaching these endpoints. So we had uh, those type of IP restrictions on the WAF level. And um, also, we, we did some work with sign cookies. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And also, uh, from an IAM policy perspective, ensure that you have a least privileged policy for any of the things that you do, uh, whether it's your services that are reaching uh, you know, to a backend application, or whether it's your, um, uh, whether it's your cl uh, cloud front that's trying to access a system or uh, access an origin that's there. And on the regulatory side, uh, one of the things that we did, we deal heavily with uh, PCI. And uh, in that sense, we ensured that we lock down an environment, and we're in the process of working through that, uh, where we have an isolated account, which is uh, only allowed to use PCI-approved services, and also making sure that uh, all the logs are centrally managed in a separate account, making sure our KMS is using customer-managed keys, and those kind of restrictions we have specifically. And also, it helps us to reduce the compliance scope. Because a lot of times when you deal with PCI, when you start attaching environments to it, then your scope increases. You know, when you have an environment that's a PCI environment, and now you're attaching to another environment, now that becomes into part of the PCI scope. And uh, for, for us to isolate the account completely that doesn't have any da you know, data center dependency, whether it's Direct Connect or VPN, it allows us to reduce that scope and also be able to produce the documents that Amazon pro uh, provides. And Amazon already has a lot of compliance documents like your PCI reports or SOC2 reports. And a lot of times it's helpful to take that report and give it to our auditors and to our legal team to help leverage some of those um, requirements that we have. And then on any uh, sensitive forms, like you're taking your critical information or things like that, disabling caching you know, on those things. And also for um, anything to do with, uh, uh, from a CloudFront side, making sure that those who are authorized to access the content, when they come through CloudFront, they, get, uh, you know, they, they have signed cookies that restricts them from being able to access it outside of the approved uh, path. Now, when we started dealing with, uh, uh, you know, with Amazon at, at the, um, from an edge perspective, what the, we had four f uh, core focus areas, right? So when I mean by Amazon uh, all in AWS Edge, from Ashurian side, what did we uh, look for? And why did we do that, right? So the first one was content delivery. You know, we had a lot of content that we had 
that was uh, uh, you know, sourced in-house or, or in the process of being deployed in different areas. And we wanted to make sure we had a centralized platform from a content delivery perspective, which allowed us to also to make sure that we had uh, uh, good edge caching. Uh, Amazon now has over 107 pops, which allows us to do edge caching and much better reach across the globe. That was one of our main uh, requirements. The second wa uh, one was endpoint protection, right? So we have multiple origins that we have that service some sort of website or some sort of a form or some sort of, uh, 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 some sort of a content that's being displayed outside. We wanted to make sure that from an edge protection perspective, they have good coverage, you know, whether it's uh, you know, origin access identity protection or making sure that there's nobody can get to the, edge, uh, to the origin directly. They have to go through CloudFront, some of that. We want to make sure that we have the uh, endpoint pro uh, protection that we have. Uh, DDoS protection and WAF and some of that areas. And uh, also we were looking heavily into serverless. With Lambdas, we already had a lot of footprint into Lambdas. We had a lot of footprint into other serverless architectures in Amazon. And just to really be able to take that and expose it uh, to the internet, we wanted to make sure that we have a good platform where we can take that uh, serverless architecture and the best practices that we've already done and be able to expose it to the internet. And finally, we have wanted to be cost effective, right? A lot of times when you're dealing with WAF, when you're dealing with uh, different services, CDN, uh, a lot of times we go into a multi-vendor approach. You jump from one vendor, and then you have some processing being done there, and then you jump to another vendor, or you come to the data center, and you have your own uh, firewalls and different things. A lot of times it can get pretty expensive. You know, now you have multi, uh, multiple vendors you're dealing with. You're dealing with multiple uh, uh, you know, challenges from transferring the data and, and inspection and things like that. It becomes pretty uh, expensive at that point. So one of the things we want to uh, ensure was we wanted to be native to Amazon so that we can be cost effective and also make sure uh, we can leverage the services that Amazon offers. And with uh, Shield Advanced, uh, we also have billing protection. So if you have a DDoS attack and there's a huge spike on your instances and you're uh, scaling up to meet that load, you also have that protection where uh, that will be credited to your account. So we had some of those advantages uh, you know, with WAF and with, you know, with, with Shield Advanced. Um, and you know, one, pretty quick we realized you know, all in AWS Edge is a team effort, right? So we have a multi-step process, uh, which I'll go through some of them uh, pretty quick. Uh, you know, I'm just going to run through this. So we had a, a, a you know, multi-step process that we had, and it was a team effort between security operations, uh, monitoring, alerting, compliance. There's just a host of team, right? So it's not a, okay, one team comes and says, hey, we, we can do this. This is how we want to do it. Then uh, kind of throw it over the fence, right? So we had to do the due diligence to make sure that, uh, you know, every t everybody's comfortable where we're going, whether it was security, whether it was people who are uh, de deploying the code, whether it's operations team, whether it's the GSOC or monitoring team, we have to make sure we do that. And I'm gonna to touch on a, a few of them. Uh, our pre-migration strategy consists of what is our time to market? You know, what is our, uh, you know, how soon do we wanna deploy it, right? So if there's a critical uh, application that, that needs to be, uh, you know, that needs to go, and if we're not ready, we wanna make sure that we take that application, give the due diligence to it, before we start using CloudFront and Lambda at the Edge and other services. And other security considerations that we had to, you know, we had to think about, and dependencies, of course, and cost. Uh, you know, how do we uh, make sure that we're, uh, you know, we're, we're doing it as per uh, being cost effective. And then from a deep dive analysis, some of the things that which helped us was our origin requirements. You know, if we have an origin that's on premises, uh, how do you protect it? You know, if people have hard coded their URLs, they had bookmarked, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, the, the pre historical origins, uh, you know, are not, uh, you know, they're not, the people are not getting uh, 404, or page, page not found, or things like that, right? And also our support impact. You know, we have an extensive support team. Uh, we have a GSOC team and an escalation point, a knock. Uh, you know, how, how does that impact the support team when they start moving into Amazon? You know, now we are talking a lot of them about serverless. We are talking about uh, different types of support models, which is a little bit different from on-premises support. So how do you manage that? And the, and then we, when we talk about roles and responsibilities, this is very critical uh, because when we are dealing with, uh, you know, WAF, there's a, you know, which team does the WAF rules? You know, we're in the process of working with multiple teams within Ashuri on making sure, uh, you know, people have coverage, right? So who creates the WAF rules? You know, who updates the WAF rules? If there's a team that's using WAF and then if their application is behaving, uh, you know, it's not behaving uh, properly, then how do they, who do they come to? You know, how do they escalate that? 
Uh, and then uh, we also had discussions with the DRT team, which is the Amazon's team that you get with Shield Advanced, where they provide you with uh, PCAP reports and different things you know, if, you have an, <coughs> if you have a DDoS attack. And uh, you know, those kind of things, we had to make sure that, okay, how do you escalate to the, to the DRT team if there's an attack on your, uh, on your edge, and things like that. And the cadence calls that we have on a, bi on a weekly basis with Amazon. Um, and then we had external requirements where it has business priorities, license implications. If there are things that are in a different vendor and you are thinking about moving into uh, in a cloud front, which one would you take first, right? So if you have something coming up in January and you want to start moving that to cloud front, then there's a license renewal impact. If that gets delayed, then you are, of course your January deadline is going to get pushed back, then which means you have to renew it. So those are some other things that uh, also we looked at. And, um, and from an operational perspective, uh, you know, creating new WAF rules. You know, that, there's a training that's involved in that where we have to get, uh, you know, people who are doing those WAF rules, if it's, a, if, it, if it's done differently, how do they write the new WAF rules when we're dealing with, uh, with Amazon WAF? And uh, training is pretty critical, you know, for any, um, any uh, you know, any new deployments where uh, from development to operational, how do you do the handoff? When you are, uh, you know, when you are doing uh, uh, deployments with uh, like blue green or AB, how do you do the training? How do you do the pen testing? Uh, things like that, and that was pretty important for us. We also created a documentation. We have multiple documentation that we have from when we are uh, leveraging with the architecture patterns of how people can leverage it if they're using microservices, if they're using, um, uh, if they're using other types of um, uh, uh, archi architectures that that can be leveraged with CloudFront. And uh, the final two things are like the migration itself, running in parallel, uh, doing some switchover. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, you know, when we are dealing with implementation patterns. And um, also with the post-migration, you know, the incident responses, if there's an attack, what happens? If there's an escalation, what happens? If there's a containment that has to happen, you know, how do we do that? So this is a typical web, web, web architecture implementation. And I'm going to walk through some of this, and then we'll jump into a demo of different types of uh, you know, value that we saw in the way that we did it on the three ones that are mentioned there. So uh, you know, it's just users coming in to CloudFront. And uh, on the bottom, you have Lambda at the edge, which is doing a lot of the multipath routing. And we're going to go through each of that in the demo we're going to be looking at. Uh, we have multipath routing, AB routing, and also the blue-green deployments. And, uh, the, uh, and then the S3 bucket, and I'll talk a little bit more when we go into each of the scenarios on what each function is. And then also, uh, the, the challenge was that you know, a lot of times we leveraged for internal services. We also leveraged for external services. There were some CloudFront we leveraged for internal services, where we wanted to make sure that internal users are using it. And then also for external services, where uh, you know, if you have a website that, want, that you want it for customers, you know, how do you do that? So there's different ways to do it. So we'll jump into a demo. So one, a couple of things I wanted to talk about in this one is um, the multipath routing use case. So one of the things well, what we looked at was uh, you know, we have dependencies that our traffic is coming into our, uh, you know, into our data center traditionally. Then you have some sort of an Nginx proxy that has rules uh, that goes between your uh, you know, on-premises servers or to a cloud instance or uh, to multiple different locations, right? Some are redirects, which are going fully into a new website. Some are uh, going within the application itself. Some are uh, those types of uh, you know, routing that happens. So what we did was we wanted to abstract that, uh, that proxy kind of a rules engine, uh, you know, externalize it, right? So if you externalize that, now you have a different team that can manage the rules, and you don't have to have a Lambda deployment every time you are changing the rules, right? So what we did was we took all the rules and put into an S3. And, uh, and, uh, and when, I, when you see the demo, it'll, it'll, you know, you'll see a little bit more about that. And we had different rules that it, it follows. And then based on that, your Lambda at the edge will, will act as a reverse proxy. So pretty much the rules engine can handle uh, you know, uh, whether it's internal, whether it's external. If it's external, it'll do a URL rewrite and send the traffic to that. If it's internal, it'll just do it within itself. Uh, let me just switch. All right. So the, let me just, 
So this, this is just, I'm just going to walk through kind of what is set up here. On the, uh, uh, on the, on the multipath routing, it's just a you know, simple CloudFront distribution. It's got a couple of, um, you know, it's got a couple of origins. Uh, you know, and then one of them is for, you know, has an, uh, an application load balancer, which has um, uh, in a container service. It's just a simple vanilla deployment. And then the other one has the S3 location. And on the S3 side, uh, you, you have multiple different uh, things it's serving. Let me just pull that up. All right. On the S3 side, you have uh, you know different locations that is there. There's um, uh, the, the pages that it's hosting. There are uh, index.html and different things. And then uh, from the uh, on the CloudFront side, you also have uh, the uh, you know on the behaviors. You also have Lambda at the edge that's servicing the main one, right? And there's two of them, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So you have a Lambda at the edge that's also servicing some of the volume, and on the and this is, the, this is this, you know, we have a, we have a page called uh, sideinfo.json. What this one is pretty much is a rules engine, right? So here you have, uh, you know, here's a path that uh, when somebody comes in and says, I want to reach the root path, then it says that, okay, it's an internal route. That's number one. And then, let me see if I can zoom it up a little bit. There you go. So it's, a, it's an internal route. <clears throat> and then it says that needs to go to index.html. Right, so that's a, just a simple routing, or there's um, you know another one. Uh, there's another path that is defined. So these are all similar to like a proxy, right? Like in a reverse proxy. So this path it says, okay, this is also internal, meaning that it's within the same origin, and this needs to go to you know cloud.html. And then if there's another path which is external, and that is uh, controlled by this value, was the number two, which means it's not within the same origin but it's going to go to an external uh, you know, URL. So now I can take, uh, you know, whether it's internal uh, routing or I can do a URL rewrite, and I don't have to deploy multiple lambdas at this point. Right? Now everything is managed by, and we'll, we'll walk through the code as well, but I, you know, I can take this one rules engine and then externalize it. The operations team can manage this. They'll have access to do this. They can add new rules. They can add new policies uh, you know, as new deployments are coming in. Right? And so this is kind of the uh, general, uh, you know, so these are the different types. So you have internal and external. So I'm, I'm going to just hit uh, some of them. I have some, some of them set up here. Uh, the, so when I go to the, uh, when I go to the root, fol when I go to the root folder, uh, it basically at that point, it, it starts, you know, it just goes into the, it's a sample application, right? So, let me just uh, yeah. So it just goes into when I when I give that specific path, like we, we talked about, on the top, it's the slash h path. So it goes into the um, into that reach cloud hosted page, right? So it's just a simple HTML page that's there, and then if you see this. This, that's really coming from this, uh, this section, right? The cloud.html is actually coming from that section. And then it's the same thing with, um, you know, when I, when I change it to, you know, when I change it to that, you know, it's going to go into the maintenance page, right? Now this one, actually, it's coming from a different uh, external, uh, it's, it's, it's actually rewriting the URL, as you can see here, and it's being sent to a totally different website, right? And, uh, and similarly, if you see, um, you know, if some other paths such as like old.html, it basically will route it based on what the rules are defined there, right? And this is something like, um, this is actually going to uh, a legacy uh, a HTML page. So this one, by, by, by doing this, you're really able to abstract away all the different uh, ways that you want uh, Lambda to function, right? It becomes like a reverse proxy. So now you can really take this as a separate, and everything is controlled by this one file, right? It's just a side info.json. And all of the rules are processed by this. And, uh, and there's no multiple Lambda deployments, right? And uh, let me just uh, do one more, and then we'll jump back into the slide. And here, if you see the, uh, on the ALB side, 
it, uh, you know, once it hits that, it goes into the ALB, into the container, and then it, you know, and at that point, it just is all processed within that container, right? Now, when we're dealing with, with the container, there's one other thing that we did was here on, on this behavior, so the ALB itself is actually in this path, right? So when I said slash ALB, it's going into that. But the web page itself is hosted on the root. So instead of being able to look for a, a directory called slash ALB in the root folder, we're doing another lambda at the edge to actually uh, redirect it to go to the root on the, on, on the container level. And I'll show you in the, in the, when we walk through the code. So here, if you see this, it's a little bit small. Um, in, the, in the beginning, if you see the, uh, in the, in the, you know, what we basically did was on the top layer, you'll see that we're making a HTTP call. And all, that is basically where your site info.json is coming from, right? So you know, here, if you, you can see this, uh, let me see if I can, there you go. Yeah. So you know, here's, here's your in, in initial handler that Lambda gets. And then it's starting to uh, you know, parse the data. And then it's making a call. You know, it gets a set site value on the you know, node. So at that point, it calls, uh, you know, it calls this function. And it, it gets the, uh, you know, the site.json file. And then it passes it back you know, into, this, uh, you know, into this function. Right? At that point here, it talks about if the picked value is 1, then it's basically an internal, it's a, it's an internal loop. Right, you're seeing it here. And then if the picked value is two, then it's, uh, you know, it's an external loop, and then it's going to pass that. Right? So based on, uh, once it gets the site info at JSON, and then it processes the request.url. And here, uh, you know, it's getting the request.url. So basically, when, uh, when you're hitting the website, the request.uri is going to get uh, you know, whatever you're going, wanting to go to whether it's a slash or slash index dot uh, slash uh, in a hitch path or the other ones that we saw. And at that point, it's going to go and check against the, uh, you know, the site info dot JSON to say, do I have this path that's defined in the site info dot JSON? If it is, then it's going to say, is it internal or external? If it's external, it's going to do a URL rewrite, and it's going to send the uh, uh, traffic. If it's internal, it's going to uh, continue to process, you know, uh, process that traffic as an internal uh, endpoint. And then anything else that's not there, if, it's sent, if, if there's something that's sent, then it'll just send it to the other page, you know, which will be uh, uh, you know, page not found or, uh, you know, or, or redirected to the home page you know, at that point. And uh, you know, so this is really the, just a recap <clears throat> you know, what we discussed. And then if you see the logs here, uh, you know, where here it's basically saying that uh, it's pointing there to the, you know, slash external path. And then at that point, it's saying that I'm going to rewrite it and I'm going to send it there. You know, so URL comes in as slash epath and then it basically takes it and then, uh, you know, uh, sends it into this, uh, you know, whole new value and sends it 302. Now, this one is the one that we talked about in the ALB side. On the ALB, since it's not hosted in a, path, a specific path within the container with the slash, AL, no, slash ALB, all this one is doing is that once, that once the content is sent to the ALB behavior, at that point, Lambda at the edge would take that, and then it would basically strip out the first part of it, the slash ALB, and then send it to the root directory. So now you can, uh, basically what you can do is you can take uh, your existing web applications and if you're having a particular path that you wanted to come in the front end, and you want to do some manipulation and being able to send it uh, you know, to the root directory of, the, uh, of your origin. So this is a, just a simple uh, script that will just take your, uh, you know, in it, your long string and then take all, uh, all the stuff. It's just doing a regular expression and stripping that off and then sending it to the origin. The second one is the A and B use case. This one really is talking about uh, you know, the same version uh, or the same origin having multiple versions, right? So now if you have uh, a deployment where you're deploying a new JPEG file or you're deploying a new uh, you know, HTML file for your website and you really want a certain amount of people to hit that version versus 
uh, the original version that you have, right? So the, some of the things that we saw that was out there or where in Lambda you could give a, uh, you know, you could make Lambda to make a determination based on a math function and then send some traffic to one versus the other. Uh, one thing what we did was we wanted to abstract that away from Lambda so that, uh, again, we're not having to deploy multiple times if you're wanting to change the version and make it dynamic. So we ended up looking at Route 53, right? So Route 53 has text records. So we basically controlled everything using Route 53 text records. And uh, we have multiple versions deployed to the same origin, and the text records will say which version you want to, you know, which you want to show. And let me jump into the demo before I go to that. <clears throat> All right. So uh, when we are dealing with A and B routing, so the way it's set up here is, you know, here you have uh, you know S3 which is hosting that, and then the behavior has uh, Lambda at the edge that's um, you know that's doing all the processing. And on the S3 side. So here you have a directory which has A and B and it's got a version one and version two, right? So basically it's just two files just for the sake of, uh, you know, for the demo here. So there's uh, two files that, you know, it's got two different versions uh, in the same origin, right? Again, we're restricted to the same origin that we are, you know, focused here. And here when we start, uh, you know, when we start hitting the endpoint, So this one, what it does is, you know, here it, it's pulling it from the A origin, you know. And, and here, what you can see is that, you know, this actually is coming from that, uh, you know, from the path, but Lambda is the one that's making the decision on where to send it, right? So it's calling Route 53, it's trying to find the text record, what the text record is, and if you look at the text record itself in the Route 53, uh, this is, this is how it looks like, right? So you've got two text records that are there. One is saying, uh, this is the path that I want to go, I want to go. And then the second one is saying, this is the you know, version two path, and then the b, dot, uh, b index dot HTML, right? So now you have text records that are actually servicing which pages to, uh, which pages to show. Now, in this example, we've obviously hard-coded the index dot HTML as well. But in a general scenario, you could just take it as a slash and then anything underneath that would be the application itself, you know, or, or if you have a different version that you're deploying it onto the same origin, right? So that's really the focus on this one. So that's where the A and B comes in. And, and then if we go into, uh, you know, into this one and say, okay, I'm going to make uh, this a zero. So right now, basically what I've said is that I don't want people to go uh, you know, to the version one. I want them to go to version two. I think it's coming from my cached pages. Um, let me see. It's great when your demo doesn't <laughs> in the middle of the demo. Um, let me go back to my, uh, let me just check the route 53, make sure it's, okay, that's. Uh, so uh, that's fine, I'll just. Uh, all right. Basically, what happens is that the route root three is the one that processes it, and then you will get uh, a version B. Uh, let me see if I can. Maybe it's start a. Yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> so, um, so the version B gets loaded here, right? So now you can see that the Route 53 actually is, um, uh, you know, it's not sending any traffic to version A because, uh, you know, we made it as zero, right? So, um, and I, you know, I had to clear my cache or whatnot, so it's, uh, it was holding the old page. So, um, but now what you can see that some traffic on the internet would be sent to version B based on, you know, how your Route 53 is configured. And the, the nice thing about this is that now you can really, uh, you know, control all your traffic routing uh, or, or your waiting through Route 53, right? So now I'm not dependent on deploying lambdas every time I want to change my weighted records. So everything is abstracted away from it. Again, uh, this is all managed through Route 53 instead of having to do with, um, having to do with uh, you know, the actual lambda code itself. <clears throat> Let me jump to. All right. So just jumping into the code on this one, uh, this is pretty much all of the code. And this one is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same principle where you're having, um, you know, you have the initial handler that's getting the, uh, you know, that's getting the request.URI. And at that point, it's calling route 53 function. And then the route 53 function gets, actually gets the, uh, let me go. So the route 53 function gets the, uh, you know, it queries the ab.logics.link in this example, and then it queries the DNS and gets the text record, right? So it's got a resolve.txt uh, from the DNS, uh, uh, you know, from the DNS. And then once it gets the value, it then parses it and then sends the value dot zero, right? So the request uh, in the bottom, if you can see, the request.uri is being set to the value that it gets it from route 53. And that way you can, uh, you know, whatever you pass it, or whatever you give it in the in the DNS as the um, you know on the record set is what is being passed. Then the 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 other one is uh, <clears throat> about the blue green uh, use case. So when we started looking at blue green, um, you know we had teams that were using uh, two different origins, right, or three different origins. So basically, what they would do is that they would take one uh, you know when they're doing deployment. They will, they'll build an uh, ELB, build an entire stack, and then slowly start sending traffic to that stack, right? So when we had, uh, when we were discussing that with, uh, you know, with CloudFront, uh, the, natively they didn't have a good way of doing blue-green within, with the two CloudFront. There was a little bit of, um, uh, you know, we were working with different teams on that. And, uh, you know, last week they, uh, they released the uh, origin uh, uh, viewer type where you could do multiple origins. Um, and, but this one we're heavily using, uh, you know, request, uh, you know, types uh, where when the request comes in, that's the, that's the uh, one that we're using. But with the blue grain, we wanted to really be able to leverage between multiple origins. You know, whether it's two ELB, uh, you know, two ELBs that has multiple applications underneath it, or it's, uh, uh, you know, S3, or, you know, however it is, right? So, so that's where we started looking at uh, the blue green use case. And it's a very similar principle that we did, uh, like what you saw in the AB, but it's a little bit of a different setup how the blue green is done. So in the cloud front, we have two origins. One is the blue origin and the green origin. And then the lambda at the edge makes a decision based on, again, querying route 53 on which origin to send it, right? Based on how much is awaited, it will send it to the appropriate origin. And this also helps with, uh, you know, canary deployments with multiple origins. So if you have, uh, you know, if you have an application and you want to send all 5% uh, of traffic to one origin all the time, right, you could keep it as that. You know, so as you have a new deployment, as you have a new release, you release it to that uh, endpoint of 5% of your traffic, and then everybody gets that, right? If there's no errors of the 5%, then you can start deploying it to the rest of it. And that's some, sometimes you could do it that way. But the main use case for us was making sure that when we have a new stack that comes up, we're able to send some traffic to it, and then being able to, um, uh, you know, completely move all the traffic to this one and then destroy the other stack. And, and the second use case we'll look at as part of the demo also is uh, uh, using persistence, right? So persistence is something that, you know, as you're dealing with applications that have some level of um, uh, cookies or things like that, you want to make sure that the user stays on the bl uh, blue uh, stack or, or on the green stack, making sure that they're not getting uh, thrown around, right, between m multiple uh, stacks if you're already in the, in the middle of a session. So let me jump into that. 
in, in this setup, what we have here is, so this one is a blue, general blue-green. So we have uh, three origins. The, the main one is the, the middle one, the S3, is the one that's going to be the one which does the behavior, where it's going to be routing based on, it's going to have the lambda that's going to be doing the routing. And then you have these two other custom origins. And they're just a straightforward ELB, which has an EC2 instance on the back end. And it has, um, uh, each of them have a home directory with a blue or with a green on the home directory. And on the behaviors, this one is the default one, which has the, <clears throat> which has the main uh, lambda at the edge, which is doing the uh, decision maker. And then uh, based on the decision, it's going to send it either to the blue or the green stack at this point, right? So when we look at this, and uh, on the Route 53, we have the same thing. You know, so we have the blue-green, and on the, on the weighted routing, it's again managed by Route 53, and all we're having here is the path where the service is going to, uh, you know, where the service is hosted, right? So on the, on the uh, uh, load balancer and the easy to instance, blue will have the slash blue as the path. It has all the files underneath it, index HTML or anything else for that, for that origin. And then the same thing with the second one, right? The second one, again, it's a, it's a text type of, uh, it's a text type. And also it's the same principle like we saw in the AB deployment. And it's using green and it's the whichever path you want. So now you can have multiple origins. You can have three or four origins, right? So you, you know, as long as your origins have unique values and you're able to route it, you can manage all of that through Route 53. And just to go here, let me just. So here, when, when you see this, when I'm going to the main uh, you know, index dot, you know, HTML, so this one actually is going to the, the, you know, the blue stack from, uh, you know, from the back end EC2 instance. Now, the EC2 instance basically uh, you know, has uh, you know, the same uh, type of um, uh, you know, index.html and it has all the same functions as a regular web server. But this one basically, you know, just to call out that it, this is being routed to that, traffic, uh, to that server. And, and we've not really done uh, you know, anything on the front end to say it needs to go to blue or it needs to go to green. Right? That's been, that decision is being made by the Lambda at the edge and uh, by, uh, by Route 53 at that point. Right? And, then, and here you can see that it's being routed through that path. And then, uh, you know, if you want to switch it to go to the other one, we could do the same uh, thing what we did the previous time, where you go to uh, your Route 53, and then you know, make this a zero. Just open now. Let me see if I can get this to work. <clears throat> sure I'm getting the right service. Um, so if you see this, it's jumped to the green one. So let me just go remove the, this one. There you go. So here you can see that um, now that Route 53 is not servicing any, um, you know, any traffic for the blue endpoint, um, it basically has queried Route 53, and Route 53 has come back and said, send all traffic to green. You know, because our weighted routing, we said uh, zero to blue and then 50 to green, right? So, 
So now you can see that uh, uh, you know, the traffic is being routed to the, you know, the green uh, path, right? So this is coming from the second load balancer, which has its own EC2 instance, which has its own uh, you know, HTML page at that point. And um, on the persistent side, you know, right? But this one, basically what it is is, once it hits this path, once it hits the slash green, it's going to stay on that as long as your application is all underneath that, right? So now that you've sent it, whether it's, you want to call it as uh, you know, origin one, origin two, uh, once you're in that origin, it's going to start you know, sending it to that path. And then with persistence, uh, you know, it's the same principle, but now the, it's also looking for a, a session cookie, right? And the persistence is, uh, you know, if you see the route 53, it has the same uh, principle where you're having the blue and the green. And then uh, all you're doing is the application is setting a cookie at that point. And then based on the cookie, Lambda at the edge is going to, if it's going to, it's going to look for a cookie. If it's not there, if it's, it's going to look for Route 53. But if, if there is a cookie, it's going to uh, automatically send it to the right uh, you know, uh, location. So in this one, I'm just going to use, uh, uh, you know, use Postman just to you know, uh, keep it uh, simple. So here you're seeing, you know, when I hit this, um, you know, when I hit this, uh, directly without any, uh, you know, this one with the persistence, blue green with uh, persistence uh, uh, URL, it goes to a page. But when I say, okay, you know, I want to use a, you know, at this point, I want to use a cookie, and it's going to start, you know, it's going to the uh, the cookie that is there. It's persistence equal to blue, and then and the same thing with, uh, you know, if I want to switch it, I want to say, you know, use this one, then it's going to switch persistence based on the persistence cookie. It's going to go to that uh, path. Right now, subsequent ones because of that, you know, you can uh, once a cookie is set, uh, you know, your application will just process it using that. Right, so now you're able to manage blue green and manage a, some level of session management or persistence on where you want, uh, you know, the website to be serviced from, and then you can expire your cookie if you want to keep it limited. So if you want to say, uh, you know, I want to make sure that people are getting a, a new query on the DNS every you know, 20 minutes, then you can expire it based on that. All right. On, on this one, you know, it's, a, it's a very similar concept where we are, uh, and in here if you see it, it's, uh, you know, it's getting the request, and uh, you know, if the request ha already has a blue or a green, it's going to continue and process it. It's not gonna do any manipulation. But if, there's not, if it's not there, then it would, uh, you know, you know, it'll call Route 53 and ask for, you know, give me the value. You know, which one do I use? Whether do I use the blue or the green value? And then based on that, it's going to process it here. It's going to add the existing URL with the value, which is the one that's passed from Route 53. And then whether it's, you know, and then it's going to add the extra stuff that it's, it's getting. If it's index.html, it'll add that. If it's root, it'll add that. If it is, uh, you know, some other home page, it's going to add that. And then any future ones, it'll skip it because it'll already have the slash blue or the slash green. And here it's the same thing. It's just calling uh, route 3 It's requiring DNS. It's going to resolve the, uh, you know, resolve the, it's as a text record, and then it's going to get that value. And the same thing with, uh, you know, session management. All we're adding here is you're adding that one extra step to say, uh, you know, I'm going to set, see if there's a persistence cookie that is set. If it is set, then I'm going to follow that path and say, you know, follow the blue or the green based on what cookie is found. If the cookie is not found, then you call Route 53 and say, hey, I don't have a preference on where I need to go, which origin I need to go. Tell me where you want me to go. And based on the uh, uh, weighted routing in Route 53, it's going to send the uh, value to the appropriate uh, endpoint. And then in the future, once a cookie is set, it's going to just take the first loop, right? It's going to come and say, yep, I see a cookie, and then it's going to send it. And again, here, you know, some of the things that we've seen where, uh, you know, you're seeing the, the route 3 setting, uh, you know, in that one where it's showing you the, the weighted routing. And then also here you're seeing the CloudWatch logs, how it's uh, setting the request.uri on the A and B deployment. And they're pretty fast, you know, as far as it's this one, and of course the duration is like one millisecond on 1.02. So the Lambda at the edge is pretty quick in, you know, determining where it needs to go. And the similar things with, uh, you know, with cookie, like in a blue-green, where here it's saying that, you know, I've, I found a persistence cookie, and it's going to go to that path where it's finding it. And if it's not there, it's going to say, I'm going to check with Route 53, 
And then once Route 3 tells me I need to go to green or blue, then I'm going to set my path to go to that, you know, to that location. And again, you can see the, uh, the, you know, the duration is pretty quick, and you know, it doesn't really have a lot of lag or anything like that. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some implementation patterns. Uh, you know, uh, when we started dealing with dependency on, on premises, some of the things that, that helps is to move some of that uh, to Amazon. A lot of times when people are deploying uh, services to, uh, to the cloud, uh, you, know, lot, you know, if you have dependencies that are uh, on premises, you know, you have to go through the process of requesting a change and then, uh, you know, putting the change in and then populating it, things like that. Uh, we moved some of that into, uh, you know, into Amazon, like in this example, you see app.example, where it has a C name for a route for three entry. So now anyone who's deploying it to Amazon, they can directly go there and, uh, and, and deal with the record set that's there for app.example53.com, right? So this helped us with a lot, lot of the migration. So instead of any time a new stack comes up and somebody has to uh, you know, attach that stack to the DNS, instead of having to go to the data center and, 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 and put a ticket in and have it deployed, we were able to leverage uh, this methodology where we were able to quickly have people control their own uh, record sets. And since the on-premises uh, DNS is, uh, you know, is, is, is basically aliased into the cloud one, we're able to leverage that you know, pretty quick. And then um, also from, uh, from a hybrid uh, environment perspective, it makes it super easy to, uh, you know, to move that into the DNS and manage the DNS dependency. And then uh, the, some of the things that you saw uh, earlier were all based on viewer request, right? So uh, the one that Amazon has released recently is an origin request. So if you're using that type of a request, uh, you can do multi-origin. But we heavily use the viewer request, right? So anything that comes in before it hits the cache, before it hits the origin, uh, we're looking at that traffic, trying to see where do you need to send it, right? So we can have a maintenance page. Now, a lot of, one of the things that is an advantage of using a maintenance is sometimes we have users who are uh, bookmarking their URLs, right? So you have somebody who's bookmarking uh, some URL that they are a favorite of. And uh, you know, with the maintenance, what we're able to do is that we're able to leverage Lambda to say, any URL that's being requested, uh, you know, uh, basically send it to the root. You know, so that'll have a maintenance page so that all the bookmarks don't fail. You know, it'll still say it's maintenance, even though, uh, you know, even though the path is a different path. Lambda at the edge is able to manipulate that URL and be able to switch over. And then, of course, the same thing with the blue-green and also with the dependencies that we have with on-premises. <clears throat> and one of the advantages of uh, the viewer request is also uh, if you have a new release that you're deploying and if you want a QA person to test it, you can basically set a header or a set a cookie that says, uh, you know, new release. So that only people who have that header will be hitting that new release, right? Nobody else will be able to hit it. So the general internet is, not, is never going to hit it. So you have a, a way to test your functionality in production without having anyone else being able to know about it, right? So you can have, like what we did with persistence is blue and persistence is green. If you have a separate one that Lambda at the edge is able to say, okay, if, when there's a new release, if there's a release equal to uh, uh, you know, green or, or release equal to go for that matter, then anyone who has that cookie is, are the only ones who are going to hit that origin. And no one else will know that it's there, right? So you can actually do live production testing at that point. And, uh, and, and, and this is another one from an implementation pattern on the APIs. Uh, when we're dealing with internal users, uh, where we don't want any external uh, access for and leveraging API gateway. Uh, this is one of the methods that we, uh, that we used is where uh, we have a way to generate the uh, policy where in, from an API uh, gateway side uh, with a source IP, right? So all the, uh, we have a custom auth valid, you know, requirement that they have to use a custom auth, which will go to Dynamo and pull all the uh, IPs that's part of Asurion. And then anyone who's leveraging that have to come from that IP, right? If they don't come from that IP, since API Gateway as of now is uh, publicly facing, we're able to lock it down where uh, it locks out everybody else who's not using Azure on IP or not coming from Azure on IP. And any other IP, uh, internal services that are there will use an at gateway and that'll be whitelisted. And some of the uh, final things about the do's and don'ts. 
Um, the, one of the main ones, you know, that uh, as, a, you know, as, a, you know, as you are leveraging edge services is make sure you get buy-in from security teams. You know, because a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, you may have a great idea and you may say, hey, this is how I want to do it. This is, our, you know, this is a great way to do this. You know, it's, it's, you know, we can do it quickly. We can do time to market, different things. But it may be a security risk, right? So, uh, you know, so that's very critical. So make sure you buy, get buy-in from security teams. Make sure that as you are looking at new services on the implications of it, right? So uh, is there governance? You know, is there a way to isolate it from the general uh, traffic if it's a... Uh, sensitive information, you know. And then the also follow a layered security model, right? You, you know, not one uh, service will solve all your security needs right? or, or solve all your problems. Like in this one, we saw how we're leveraging Route 53. We're leveraging, uh, you know, Lambda at the Edge. We're le leveraging viewer requests. We're leveraging multiple things to solve these use cases. So uh, always look for a layered approach. And especially in the area of security, also look for a layered approach, right? Like CloudFront has like geo restriction. Uh, you know, you have WAF where you can do IP restriction. Uh, you know, you have uh, WAF rules that can do, uh, you know, SQL injection and other types of protection. You have DDoS. So you have multiple different types. And then, of course, on the application layer, uh, you know, doing code reviews, you know, making sure you're using tools that will do, uh, you know, some level of security checks on your code itself. And, uh, and also, uh, this is something that uh, is very helpful where, uh, you know, the compliance reports that Amazon provides, uh, the SOC 2 reports, the PCI reports, and, and, you know, as your legal team or your audit team has requirements for those type of uh, uh, reports, make sure that you're leveraging Amazon's rep uh, compliance reports on top of your controls. And, of course, training. You know, that's pretty, cr uh, it's very critical, because a lot of times, it, if it's a new thing that people are not used to, it makes it harder for adoption because people are not comfortable with it. And then there's a lot of questions on how do you implement it, make sure there's a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, confluence or some place where you're documenting all your best practices and being able to uh, show people how this works. And uh, also for ownership, especially with the cloud, one of the things that we're going through as a journey is uh, ownership, right? So uh, in the traditional model, you may have a uh, you know, very siloed team that maintains different stacks or different, uh, different areas. But in the, uh, in the Amazon space, a lot of that gets a uh, little bit gray, right? So who manages the WAF rules? You know, who manages the deployments? Who manages uh, the CICD process, right? Uh, is it the development team? Is it the operations team? You know, what's the responsibility of the NOC? What's the responsibility of the security team at that point? You know, so make sure that you sort that out. You solve those problems you know, from, a, from a RACI perspective. Um, some of the don'ts are uh, you know, one of the things that can be tricky or multi-network, uh, multi-vendor network hops. Uh, you know, we talked briefly about that. Uh, you know, you don't want to have multiple vendors you're jumping. Uh, you know, because now you're going to one vendor, then they're going to, you know, route it back into your data center, and then you're trying to go back into AWS. So that can be tricky. And um, and also open security groups. Uh, you know, Amazon has some patterns that they put out on how you can lock down uh, traffic only from CloudFront to be able to reach your origin. So there's a lot of good practices there where you're making sure that what is allowed to be able to reach to my origin. Uh, and don't allow open security groups. Uh, some of the visibility changes with the cloud, make sure you set the right expectations, right? Some things are not as visible as a prior. So make sure that you understand that, okay, this is less visible in the cloud versus on-premises. Um, of course, lift and uh, you know, shift can be uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, make sure you're accounting for that. And uh, also challenges you'll have with self-signed certificates, right? So make sure you're not doing self-signed certificates. Make sure you're, um, you know, you're using legitimate certificates that are uh, from trusted authorities. Uh, just a really quick recap, you know, some of the uh, you know, things that we saw, the benefits uh, of doing a layered methodology approach where you're not just focused on solving one thing, but you have a multiple different things that you're trying to solve from a network perspective, content perspective, and also uh, what are some of the strategies, and then some of do, do's and don'ts, right? So that's critical. So, and for that, I'd like to thank you for attending the con uh, session, and thank you.